But I invite you today to do our Easter call and response. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. One of the privileges of being asked to preach is I get to indulge in a few of my favorite Easter rituals. You see, last week I had a 101 temperature, was coughing, and had a runny nose. So what do those symptoms make you think of? COVID. COVID. You guys are quicker than last night. I think they still, like, weren't sure if they should talk in church. So on Easter Sunday, I went to urgent care. Not because I was really terribly sick. In fact, a year and a half ago, I would have even gone to the doctor with a little temperature and a runny nose and cough. But I wanted to get a COVID test to determine if my family needed to be concerned about having COVID. My three boys and I had just spent the week together on what was the best we could put together a COVID safe spring break trip. We didn't spend much time with other people, but we were in the car and hotel room all together. I had a fever, and we needed to know if we had COVID in our family before exposing Pat's family to COVID on Easter Sunday. We needed to know if we had COVID before my kids headed back to in-person school after Easter. They had all just finally gotten back to in-person right that week before break. And, oh my goodness, not just because I'm sick of them being at home, but also they learn better in school. So I just don't want them to be quarantined anymore. So we needed to check it out. I'm sharing all this with you for a few reasons. One, I had a negative PCR, the actual gold standard, um, test, but I also had a negative antibody test, so if I blow the windows during worship, it's okay. To remind us, my second reminder is to remind us that COVID is still around and something to be concerned about, especially for those who are not yet fully vaccinated, which includes me. I had my first dose right before spring break. I was able to get an appointment an hour and a half straight west of the cities. So it made a four and a half hour trip down to Iowa, a six and a half an hour trip down to Iowa. But I was glad to have one vaccine in. Also to remind us all that COVID is still around and something to be concerned about, especially for young children. Uh, it impacts their lives, it impacts their schools, and it impacts their families. So thank you. No matter what you think about these things, I appreciate that you're wearing mask at worship today. And continue to wear your mask in the community, no matter if you're in Wisconsin or Minnesota or Iowa. The third reason I tell you is that I missed the often Lutheran tradition of saying, Christ is risen. As a young pastor, I remember talking with my mom about planning Easter Sunday services. She said she always liked that. Christ is risen. He is risen so I incorporate it into Easter and the Easter season every chance I get. Yes, we are in the Easter season. And that is why I get to wear my favorite alb that was given to me at ordination by the church I grew up in. That's why we light the Paschal candle. In fact, if you didn't know, technically, every Sunday is Easter Sunday. You see, for a long time, the early Christians who were raised and continued to be Jewish would gather for Saturday Sabbath and would gather again on Sunday to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. So if you're worshiping with us at home, go grab some of your Easter candy and enjoy it while I preach. Sit with a great cloud of witnesses who gather at home and here and in heaven, and let's worship together. You know, I can just picture President Ronald Reagan grabbing his jelly beans and saying, this is a pretty 
preacher I can listen to. <laughs> Today's scripture takes us back to the first Easter Sunday. I sent this sermon to a few people, and one of them was an extremely faithful woman of the church that I grew up in. And she said, I didn't realize that the walk to Emmaus took place on the first Easter. I thought it took place many days later. And this is a woman who, uh, I don't know if she's ever missed a Sunday service and attended and has led many, many Bible studies over the years, including Sunday school, when we had a Sunday school. The scripture passage is often titled The Road to Emmaus, but I think it misses the point. I think it misses the point that this happened on the first day of Easter. I think it should instead say, in the evening of Easter, or the evening of that first Easter. Something to drill into our head that this happened that first day. This story is rarely shared on Easter Sunday. A lack of wisdom on the part of the wise people who set up our lectionaries. It's sometimes read, but not always, the Sundays after Easter. But I want to tell you, growing up, I never remember leaving Easter Sunday at church contemplating the confusion or the anxiety of the first Easter. Now, anxiety is a word we don't oftentimes hear in Scripture, and in fact, I didn't do a research on it, but I don't know if the word anxiety even shows up in the Bible. But that doesn't mean that they weren't anxious. Oftentimes we hear the word fear. But in today's society and in our daily lives, even before COVID, we've experienced anxiety. And there was anxiety that first Easter Sunday. I didn't contemplate the anxiety or fear or confusion about Easter. Instead, I have vivid memories of Easter, of the noise of a busy church on Easter Sunday. I'm sure attendance here was the highest it's been in over a year. I remember greetings of extended family of church members who had gathered on Easter Sunday, some who would travel long ways, who we only saw when they would come home for holidays. And I remember the smells of Easter Sunday Church. It was our Luther League. Does anybody know the term Luther League? Oh, a few people. So you, you might be about my age, because Luther League is an old term. I'm old for youth group. Saturday, the Luther League would gather to make egg dish with ham and cheese. Somehow that plain old white bread tasted really good. I'd snack a little bit while I was making it, not very sanitary. We'd pick up fresh eggs from the church member whose farm included a large chicken egg production. We would set up the old heavy tables in the church basement. Does anybody remember old heavy tables in churches? I am certain that those really nice white Lightweight tables were invented by a church member who had hauled those church tables in and out a few too many times in their years of going to church. We set out the red water glasses for juice and water and the real silverware and real glass plates. We get the large percolating coffee pot ready to plug in in the morning and have the hot pads ready to pull out that hot egg dish from the old Miss church ovens. Sunday morning, people would bring fresh, warm caramel rolls, cinnamon rolls, and tea rings. Does anybody know what a tea ring is? Oh, my mom made the best tea rings. Tradition for Easter and Christmas morning. There's not a youth group there anymore. There hasn't been for years. But they carried on their Easter breakfast tradition. Just the adults would bring it instead of the youth coordinating it. There's not a youth group anymore in that little church in the country because there's only one young family that comes. And they drive quite a ways because they're from another town. But they've started coming because they like the family feel. 
they haven't had new members there for years. But the faith, the faith that they helped plant in my life and the life of my sisters and my whole family, well, that and the many families connected with that church, that faith continues to thrive. And I will tell you another thing about Easter Sunday. Even as I come to study and preach about the first Easter and all of the fear and sadness of that Sunday, I still experience and walk away from the Easter season's worship services with a sense of joy. I did last night. It was so good to see some familiar faces. And I'm sure I'm going to walk away today with a sense of joy because I already feel it seeing their familiar faces gathering and how beautiful it was to sit up front and hear your voices with mine as we would read things together and sing together. Oh, I miss that. So today as I preach, I'm going to share with you a little bit different story about Easter. I am going to share some more memories with you. I think about the church I grew up in, and I may shed a few tears. I may reach for this Kleenex box like I did last night, as I deeply miss my parents, my brother, my sister, and many who have died. I miss a lot of people who are part of the great Easter Sunday memories. My tears may make you uncomfortable. You see, it's kind of a funny thing. If I was a male preacher, my tears would make you think, oh, he's so sensitive and thoughtful. But there's something about a woman preacher crying that makes women people feel uncomfortable. But if I make you uncomfortable, I am not sorry for that. For maybe my tears will make you stop and think a bit more about what that first Easter truly was like for the followers of Jesus. And even after they got report after report of an empty tomb or someone who saw Jesus, they were still in fear for many, many days. Listen to these words from Scripture once again. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you're walking along? Remember, they didn't recognize him. He was a stranger, interrupting their private conversation. They stopped walking. They stood still, looked sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered Jesus, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days. Now remember, everyone in Jerusalem, not everybody was a follower of Jesus. But everybody knew what had taken place. This conversation is a little bit like my earlier question, what do my symptoms of a fever and cough make you think of? And automatically you said COVID. But can you imagine anyone not knowing about COVID now? Does anybody remember last year, early in the pandemic, there were a few people who had been on a secluded vacation or a retreat who were interviewed on the news after emerging from their seclusion, unaware of a worldwide pandemic and coming out into some new world where everyone was being quarantined and wearing masks and the whole world had changed. Does anybody remember that on the news? Okay, I'm not the only one who watched oh, too much news this past year. Maybe you didn't, but I've watched too much news. That was the response of these two people of Jesus. 
Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who doesn't know what's been going on? I find it curious that Jesus does not reveal himself to them at this point. I mean, why make them take time to tell the long, gruesome, heartbreaking details of the hope they had for a Messiah and then the cruel death and resurrection, maybe resurrection, of Jesus while they're walking further and further away from Jerusalem towards Emmaus. Why did Jesus walk along with them and let them go on and on and on about the story of, well, well the story of himself, the story of Jesus? Now, you might expect that I'm going to give you some wise, pastor-like insight as to why Jesus walks and listens. And I'm sure that there are plenty of that's written by scholars and people who, I'll just be honest with you, plain old guess. Because the scripture does not tell us why Jesus walks and listens. We only know he does. So today, we're just going to ask that question. Why did Jesus not reveal himself right away? Why did he make them share the story again? And along with that question, we're going to allow all of our questions to be heard, like that of the first Easter, when Jesus heard many questions. Instead of giving you fancy answers, well, I'm just going to tell you another story. A story from just a few days ago. A story from right after Easter. You see, I was in western Iowa, and I was driving to a town that I will not name in order to protect my own, um, my own reputation, so you don't call any town to try to get me in trouble. I had stopped at a stop sign, you know how you pull up, and I looked both ways, and in the meantime, someone else stopped at the stop sign on the other side of the road, and we did that glance that you do when you're being safe, when you kind of check to make sure they're paying attention, because I was going to turn left, and I didn't want to run into them, and they kind of waved at me, and I'm like, oh, okay, that's nice, I was here first, but that's nice, you're acknowledging I get to go first. And so I had my blinker on, I started to pull out, and this kind of wave went to this kind of wave. And then he started waving his hand outside the window and shaking his head and started to say something, which I didn't know what he was saying. And I'm like, there's, there's some cars coming really close. What? what? What are you doing? So I just looked at him puzzled as I turned. Does anybody know why he was waving at me? What? I turned the wrong way on a one-way street. <laughs> oh, and you know what? That's what I did in my car. I laughed out loud at myself. Now, thankfully, the road wasn't very busy. And thankfully, there was no one parked in the whole side, right side that was all marked for parking. So I just drove on that side till I got to the next block and turned and um, laughed at myself for going the wrong way on a one-way street. Thankfully, it was Western Iowa. Thankfully, I didn't get into a car accident. Um, but bless this man's heart. I mean, honestly, bless this man's heart. He was trying to save me from a ticket, at the least. Maybe some embarrassment, an accident, or worse. I mean, he likely didn't even think about the fact that he looked like a complete fool waving his arms out the window, yelling whatever he was yelling at me. It wasn't me, because he looked, had this concerned look that I couldn't figure out. He was doing all he could to help me that day. It makes me wonder what that walk to Emmaus was like for Jesus. Did he want to shake his head and wave his arms and tell the two, and honestly, everyone else who was confused about what had happened, not only, I told you so, I tried to tell you, are you not listening? I mean, over and over in Scripture, he tells them over and over, and then three days arise again, but they're all afraid. And did he 
did not want to give them a sign that they were figuratively and literally going the wrong direction. Does Jesus want to do that for us even today? Does he want to wave his arms and shake his head and look like a fool in self in order to save us from doing something wrong, save us from an accident or intentional injury to ourself or others? I'm sure there are times when Jesus wants to do such a thing. In fact, I am sure there are times that Jesus does just that, shows up in our lives in such a way that we actually do see him doing all he can to give us signs of his love and his desire that we make good choices for the goodness of ourselves and those around us, that we make good choices and we go the right way. In fact, I believe that Jesus sent that man to wave his arms and shake his head at me. And I am not sure why I didn't figure it out. I'm not sure why I didn't get into an accident. Maybe so you could have a good sermon illustration. You'll have to tell me if that worked after church. I do not know why it is that sometimes we recognize Jesus and sometimes we don't. But I do know that God shows up in our lives and I know that Jesus walks with us. I know that sometimes we see Jesus and many times I don't recognize him. I do believe that there are times when our ability to recognize Jesus is kept from us, just like it was kept from the two. Only one whom we know for sure was a man. Who would, the two who were walking on the road to Emmaus. That's something else that I learned while I prepared for this sermon. Or at least this time I remembered. We don't know who the other person was. It says there were two walking. Some biblical scholars think the other person was a woman, maybe a spouse. Or maybe the two were father and child. Another unanswered question. But I can tell you that the Easter Jesus showed up for me this past week. You see, even though I was in urgent care instead of Easter Sunday worship, Jesus showed up in the kindness of the medical workers who didn't shame me for being careful and wanting to confirm if I did or did not have COVID. And Jesus showed up in giving me a negative test, at least this time, so that I could text my husband before I left the clinic, who then told his children, who had stayed outside at the grandparents' house and were being very careful around the grandparents, aunts, uncle, and cousins, Jesus allowed them to let down their COVID safety guard, and instead of just being there a brief period to say hello from the yard, they got to have an Easter egg hunt, stay a little longer than they planned, eat with their family, and give some deeply missed hugs to their family from Nebraska and to Iowa before they climbed back into the van and headed back to Wisconsin. I was in a different town where the urgent care was, so I missed out on the family Easter gathering. But the Easter Jesus showed up for me as I stayed in Iowa and I drove to my hometown. Jesus traveled with me. Jesus showed up in the kindness of my mother-in-law for whom I sheepishly asked, could I have that boss? box of odds and ends flowers that you said you've kept and reused from your trips to the cemetery so I could have Easter with my family. She gave me those flowers. And Jesus showed up in the kindness of a dear couple in my hometown who had picked up the Christmas wreaths off my family's gravesides because with COVID I haven't made many trips down to Iowa. Then they helped me make the bundles of flowers into five beautiful bouquets to place on the grave sites of my grandparents, my parents, my brother, and my sister. And then I had Easter with my family. 
fail me. My grandpa died before I was born. My grandma when I was two. I don't remember Easter with them. But I will always remember this Easter that I spent with them. And I miss my parents. And I miss my sister. And I was only eight when my brother died. But I miss him too. Jesus showed up while I was in the cemetery. As two cemetery workers paused their work to talk with me, I didn't recognize them, but they introduced themselves, and then I remembered their family names. And we talked as the grass was turning green beneath our feet to remind us of new life in the midst of death. Jesus showed up as they told me stories, old stories, about the old tractors that we had found in the shed. A tractor I didn't even remember my dad had. It was an old farm old tractor. And the man said, oh yes, that was your grandpa's tractor. It had an old wooden um, bucket on the front, right? I said, yeah, it was so unusual. And he said, I remember your brother and your dad bringing that to the Thresherman show, along with the John Deere tractor that your brother had restored. My dad was around to tell me those stories. But Jesus showed up so I could have some family stories for Easter. Now remember, I'm not sorry if you're uncomfortable with my tears. Because that first Easter Sunday, there were lots of tears. Because they thought their Messiah was still dead. And they couldn't understand what happened. <laughs> Jesus showed up. As I drove to another town to see good friends of mine at their daughter's track meet, he said, we're busy tonight in a track meet. I said, I don't care. I'll come see you there. And I found more people there that I knew and who knew my family. One woman who asked about my sister who was living and my other sister who passed away, her, his husband, her husband, who is now remarried. And then she shared the story of her mother dying when she was young. Words that I now carry in hope that I can now be more supportive of my nieces whose mother died too young and who one of them is getting married this summer and i do anything to have her mother there instead of me. And Jesus showed up in my text messages to my living sister giving her the many greetings that I had received from those people who love our family. showed up. As I later talked with my sister, a conversation filled with my stories about how many unexpected things had fallen into place, including we had a chance to pick out some special gifts that we were able to um, give to my niece for her upcoming wedding. And Jesus continued to travel with me as I headed back home, and on the way I stopped to see my deceased sister's husband, his new wife, and their toddler son. This year was not what I would consider a typical Easter celebration. But I did find out that the church I grew up on in had Easter Sunday services, and they had the traditional Easter breakfast with homemade cinnamon rolls. I don't think there were any tea rings there. And they still don't have a youth group. But the faith of that church is alive and well. No, I didn't get to do an Easter egg hunt, nor did I get an Easter breakfast. 
But my kids got a basket full of Easter candy. And while I was writing the sermon, I indulged in a few of their chocolate ramen eggs. And they didn't even get upset with me when I confessed about that later. No, I didn't get to gather for Easter with my family. But I did give my kids a hug, because if they had COVID, they already had it. And I said, I love you, before I headed to urgent care, and they headed to be just outside with the other family, which after my negative rapid test, they were able to stay, enjoy, eat, and hug with their family. No, I didn't get a chance to gather with my sister who is living, but I connected with her in a deeply meaningful way. And I was able to visit the rest of my family at the cemetery in Iowa, something I may never do on Easter Sunday again. And I was able to set lots of text messages to other family members and friends. Yes, over this last week, I have shed a few tears. And if you missed gathering with your family for Easter, you might have too. Including writing this sermon, and when I preached it twice now, you think about the second time, I've had a few less tears. But my tears are ones that I hope you see as the great joy and thanksgiving that I have of being loved by my family and humbled to be loved by God. Our lives, you see, are much more like the walk to Emmaus the evening of that first Easter than any of our Easter traditions. They didn't gather for worship on that first Easter. They didn't have communion on that first Easter. They gathered in tears. And many walked home after the big events of the weekend, confused and sad and mourning. You see, our lives are much more like the walk to Emmaus on that first Easter where Jesus shows up. He loves us dearly. And instead of always revealing himself quickly, he allows us to have our questions, our fears, our anxiety. Did you hear that? He allows us to have those fears and anxiety. So those who have ever said to you, oh, you just need to have faith when you're a little worried about something, I'm not so sure they've read their scripture closely. He allows us to have those things, and he allows us to have and tell our story. As long as it takes. Maybe as many times as we need to say it. He allows us. He allows us to have those questions about why Jesus shows up in one way or in our life, but then, at least to us, seems to disappear. And why does that happen? Jesus listens and he walks with us even when we do not know he is with us. It reminds me of the story of the footprints in the sand. Why are there only white set here, Jesus? Because there, that's when I was carrying you. I sent this sermon to my in-laws, parents and sisters, and brother-in-law, some other family members, and many friends that I got to see over Easter. I did an introduction to the sermon, and I said, um, you're in my sermon over the weekend. Don't worry, I only make fun of myself. I also said, if I offended you by any way, I'm very, very sorry, because I never intend to do that when I'm preaching. 
And then I told them that um, it was longer than a Catholic sermon. In fact, it's longer than most modern day Lutheran sermons. Thank goodness we're not singing as much and don't have all this beautiful special music you usually have after Easter because you gave me a little more room in this sermon today. But you can also be very glad that God didn't call me to be a Baptist preacher. <laughs> Jesus showed up again in your laughter because Jesus lets us laugh. And Jesus showed up in the email responses I received from Pat's sisters and that dear, dear friend in Iowa for whom um, is a member of that church. She's the only one who noticed a misspelled word. Jesus shows up and then then Jesus sits with us to nourish us, to feed our spirits and our minds and our souls and our bodies. Jesus sits with us. In fact, I'll invite you today to receive communion sitting down because that's how it happened on that first Easter Sunday. This is the only scripture that tells about Jesus serving communion on the first Easter Sunday. They sit down together and he reveals himself in the breaking of the bread. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. that together. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia.